today we're going to look at this model here. This is uh, one of our examples that we ship with the product. Now it's a pretty small model, but it does have you know uh, quite a quite a bit of uh, distribution network out here, uh, mostly junctions, demands, and so forth. Um, there is a pump station here that pumps up to a tank at this point over here. Um, so this is the full version of the model. So you could go with this, or let's take a look at the skeletonized version of the same model. So you can see, and I'll switch back and forth one more time. So these are hydraulically equivalent models. So if we were to look at this skeletonized model, for example, looking at the uh, the pump and the tank uh, graphing flow in the pump and tank hydraulic rate, they should be exactly the same between the models. They're hydraulically equivalent. So if you have Bentley ham, um, sorry, Bentley water gems, you can take advantage of the scalibrator tool and uh, you know pretty quickly simplify the model down. What that does is it creates, like I said, a hydraulically equivalent version of that full model by you know, basically lumping your demands uh, on the, you know, the elements that are left over. Um, if it has to combine any pipes in series or parallel, it combines them in such a way that they're hydraulically equivalent. So you can see, for example, at this junction, there's six, six demands that are contributing to that, and those were at one point uh, further downstream. So this is the model that we're going to focus on today. Uh, for our demonstration of uh, some of the things you can do. So um, just to run through some of the basics of, you know, what you need to do if you're starting out with a water model that's existing, what kind of things do you have to enter to get it uh, in a, you know, condition that's ready for transient analysis. So in this case, um, pretty common, common case here, you're trying to simulate uh, what happens if this pump has an emergency shutdown. Um, you're starting with the pump on, pump turns off, what happens? So the first thing you want to do is look at the pump properties and a lot of different elements you'll notice, um, you know, if you're used to water gems or water CAD, you'll see that there's a transient section in the properties. So those things can actually be entered as you're building your water model, even water CAD and water gems, you'll see these properties. So you can actually add those ahead of time as you're building the model so that it's actually uh, even more so ready for Bentley Hammer. Um, but if you don't have those things entered already, uh, don't have to worry about it. There's uh, just a few key things to look at. So for a pump, for example, we need to configure what that pump will be doing, uh, which is to say, in this case, it's going to shut down after time delay. So I'm going to pick shut down after time delay as the pump type. We're going to choose 400 millimeters as the diameter and a time delay of five seconds. So this basically means that five seconds into the transient simulation, this pump will shut down, which means basically the power is cut off from the pump and the pump will continue to spin down based on the momentum, um, but you will tr typically have, uh, you know, some, some type of transient response as a real result of that, you know, sudden pump shutdown. So in order to accurately simulate uh, that, you know, spinning down of the pump, there are a couple of other properties that you need to enter. So if I go into the pump definition, you'll notice there's a transient tab here. So in the transient tab, there's a few things you have to enter. So you get your inertia, your speed, and your specific speed. So the inertia has a nice little calculator tool here. You click on this, and you can actually enter the brake horsepower and rotational speed, and it will calculate your inertia for you. And I'll also enter the speed here. Specific speed is a um, bit of a, an advanced concept. Uh, this is more a function of the shape of your pump. Uh, there is an equation in the help that can help you estimate which one of these to select, but it basically allows Hammer to figure out how the pump can operate, not only in the first quadrant, the positive head, positive flow, but out here in the other three quadrants, um, negative head, negative flow. Okay, so now that I have those things entered, we're just gonna go with the default for the specific speed. So we're done with the pump. So the next thing we wanna enter is the wave speed for our pipes. So you'll notice when you look at a pipe, there's a wave speed property. So this is something that you have to enter for every pipe. So this is basically how fast a wave will travel in that pipe, which can you know, be a, a significant factor in how the waves reflect and inter interact with each other. So it's something that you, you know, want to make sure you get that accurate. Um, it's a function of a couple of different things, you know, your pipe material, how it's supported at the ends, so how thick it is. Um, luckily, Hammer has a nice little tool uh, under the tools menu, wave speed calculator, where you could enter a couple of things and have it apply, uh, calculate and apply the wave speed to all your elements. So in this case, um, it's a pretty simple example. All these pipes are ductile iron, so we're gonna apply the same to all. So all I have to do is pick 
from the engineering library what our liquid is. So I'm just going to choose water at 20 C. And then from our material library, we actually have some of the coefficients that you need um, already available in the library. So for ductile iron, for example, it has the uh, Young's mo modulus and poisons ratio. So I'm going to select that. So I'm going to populate that, and we'll just assume a wall thickness anchored throughout, and it's going to, going to apply to all pipes. So we'll click OK, and it tells us that it applied that to all the pipes. So now if we look at the properties, we'll see we have a wave speed entered. Um, another shortcut to that, and um, that kind of segues to our next next task that we need is uh, to set up the transient specific calculation options. So if you go into analysis calculation options, if you're used to water cat or water gems, you're really just working under the steady state slash EPS solver options. But there's a, actually a separate calculation option set for transient specific settings. Uh, so let's just go through a few of the basic things that you'll uh, you'll pretty much always want to make sure you enter. So looking at the transient uh, calculation options, first thing you want to do is choose what points in the model, which is to say which elements you will save transient results for. So by default, it's not going to save any results for any of the elements. You'll only be able to look at profiles. So you want to choose some key points. So in the drop down, I'm going to select selected points. And then from here, click the dot, dot, dot and then select from drawing at the bottom. So you don't want to select everything in the model. You want to select just your key points that you'll probably want to graph uh, pressure or flow or you know, basically the points of interest that you want to look at. So I'm going to choose the pump. And this is a high point here, J4. And I'll also choose the tank. And then click the checkbox. And then the single arrow pointing to the right side to add those to the collection of selected items. And click OK. The report times basically tells the program how often to save results. So a report period of 10 basically means that it's going to save results for your graphs at every 10 time steps. And we'll just accept that default. So the next step is to decide if you want to specify a custom calculation time step. So Hammer actually calculates this for you and attempts to do a balance between performance and accuracy. So if you go under analysis, transient time step options, Let's calculate the initial conditions first. Analysis, transient time step options. You'll see that Hammer calculated this as your hydraulic time step. Uh, we're going to go you know, basically accept that for this demonstration, but you could, if you wanted to, override that and specify a custom time step. Um, that, that can also be done from this option right here. So next thing is to set how long we're going to run the model for. So by default, it's actually in terms of time steps, but most people don't think in those terms. So we're going to actually choose based on time, and we can add um, a duration in seconds. So I'm going to choose 90 seconds for our simulation duration. So you want to make sure to run it long enough so that you know things will settle down a bit. So you're not only capturing what happens as the event occurs, but also you know how things settle down. So you want to run it long enough so that you can see and make sure that things have uh, you know settled down a bit. Okay, so the other thing that's really important here is this generate animation data option. So this allows you to, later on, after you've computed the transient simulation, allows you to actually animate and uh, really get a better visual of what, you know, how things are interacting with each other during a transient simulation and really helps you understand, you know, what's going on and uh, what you might need to do. So um, default is false, so I highly recommend that you choose true for this for pretty much any model. And in conjunction with that, what we want to do is set up some profiles. So we're going to do that next after we set up all these options. Um, the other options here, most of the time you don't have to touch them. If you're just running a steady state simulation for your initial conditions, you don't have to enter a time here for initialized transient run at, run at time. But actually for this example, we're running an EPS simulation where we want to choose which time to you know, basically use as our starting steady state conditions. So to give you an idea, I'm just going to graph the pump here along with the tank. Right-click graph. So here we can see it's uh, pretty typical. You got your your tank is draining, pump turns on, tank fills, and then you know kind of cycles back and forth. So what we want to do is make sure that we're starting our steady state uh, simulation for Hammer at a time at an appropriate time. So for example, uh, seven hours is when the pump is on. Uh, so what we can do is initialize the transient run for time step seven 
And that way, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, the pump is starting on, tank is up near the top. And then basically what we're going to see in hammer is, you know, what happens between this time and this time. So like I was saying, and, you know, for just a standard steady state, all you see is, okay, what well, at one time, pump is on, the next time, pump is off. You don't actually see the details of what happens as a result of any transient effect between those time steps unless you use hammer. So let's go back to those calculation options, and we're going to enter seven hours for this. And then getting back to that animation data, so along with that, we want to make sure to specify any profiles that cover the areas of interest. So I'm going to go to Profiles. That's also under View Profiles. And click on the New button. Select from Drawing. So what you want to do is select the area of interest that you're interested in um, seeing the transient effects of. So for this model, it's pretty straightforward. It's just one long line. If you have a more complicated model, or for example, that full model where it, you know, things are a little bit interconnected, you may want to make a few profiles that cover different sections so that you can you know, check a, a few different key areas. Uh, so it's really easy to make a profile. I'm just going to start at the upstream point, the reservoir, and then click on the downstream point, the tank, and it draws the profile for me. So I click the checkbox, open profile. And here we have the initial conditions profile. Okay, so Hammer will use this uh, to generate animation data for results uh, after the transient simulation. So we're going to give this more appropriate title, so we'll just call it full. Um, another thing you might want to do at some point uh, is make a, maybe a more detailed view, for example, from this reservoir out to here. Make another profile there. And for this one, I'm going to call this one pump detail. So if you have a really long model, you know, several kilometers, uh, you know, something to the point where, you know, when you're looking at the full profile, you don't really see that detail, you may want to consider, you know, adding a few uh, more, you know, focused in profiles. Okay, so now we're ready to compute the transient simulation. So the first thing we want to do, I've already computed the initial conditions, and that's this button. Um, next thing we want to do is validate. So that's this button. That's going to check if we made any mistakes. Okay, so we didn't find anything of interest. This is one that we can ignore. So we're basically ready to run. And uh, I will go ahead and click the regular compute button to compute the transient simulation. Okay, so when that's done, you get the summary here that has some statistics on uh, max and minimum pressure, but this, um, this doesn't tell you a whole lot in terms of visualizing exactly what's going on. So, um, you know, Taking a step back a little bit, uh, so what we've just done is basically ran a simulation to see what happens when these pumps shut down without any kind of protective measures. So maybe this is the you know, proposed system or the system as it's working uh, as is. Um, so we'll consider this uh, sort of a no, no protection uh, situation here. So um, in order to view your transient results, what you do is you use a tool called the Transient Results Viewer. And that's from this icon here or from Analysis Transient Results Viewer. So you have three tabs here. The first tab is for basically viewing your profiles, and the other two tabs are for graphs. So I'm going to take a look at the profile first, and uh, you'll see that we have both the full and the pump detail profile available. I'm just going to go with the default here of a hydraulic grade and air slash vapor volume. Click Profile. Make this a little bit bigger for you. Okay, so what this is showing you is what we call the transient envelope. So the red line and the blue line is uh, your maximum hydraulic rate and your minimum hydraulic rate over the course of the transient simulation. So you can see here, the, you know, the green line is your ground elevation, black line is your starting uh, hydraulic rate. So there's a high point right here, and we can notice at the top here there's a, a volume reported, and this is a vapor volume. So I'm going to go ahead and animate this. The pump is over here on the left side, so you'll notice when the time gets to five seconds, you'll see the transient event curve. So one, two, three, four, and there's our transient, the wave propagates downstream, and I'm just going to pause it right there. You'll notice that as the wave traveled downstream, it pretty quickly dropped below atmospheric pressure at this high point here, and it got down to a point where it exceeded the vapor pressure limit of water, which caused a vapor pocket to form here, and that's what you see forming. So I'm just going to inch forward a little bit so you can see that that vapor pocket continues to grow in size, but also notice this wave as it reflects off the end of the system, it comes back, and then the vapor pocket senses the positive pressure returning, and it starts to uh, diminish. So when it gets to the point where it's just about 
gone, you'll notice a certain phenomenon here. So see the uh, spike in hydraulic rate? So this is, this is a phenomenon that occurs when you, know, you have the two water columns on either side of your vapor pocket basically slam together. And the effect is similar to an instant valve closure where you have, you know, just like with the pump shutdown or a valve closure, a sudden change in momentum. So the you know, water is nearly incompressible and it's basically crashes together like, uh, you know, a, a head on car crash. And that causes a severe transient. And I'm going to go ahead and click play here. And you can see that bounces back and forth. And you know, that's basically the cause of our, you know, maximum pressures that we're seeing in, in most of the model. And then as it bounces back, that reflects as a low pressure wave, and that also causes some you know, lower pressures at points. Um, so we can see that you know, this system probably is in need of some kind of transient protection method, uh, you know, some kind of measures to protect against these uh, problems. This could, you know, this could cause some major problems here. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. Um, and uh, now that you've seen the skeletonized model and uh, you know, how how quickly I was able to enter things and get it to a point where I could see some transient results. Let's switch back to the full model here. And I just want to make a few points to reinforce why it's a good idea to skeletonize the model if possible. Um, and basically, if you're dealing with the full model, there's that much more configuration in terms of the transient simulation. So we talked about like entering the wave speed of your pipes. Well, you know, if you have full pipe model, then you have to consider, okay, these are ductile iron pipes here, but over here, uh, these are PVC, and then there's some steel pipes over here. So you have to, you know, do a little bit more work in getting your wave speeds entered, um, act, you know, to accurately simulate what goes on in this part of the system. A um, couple other things you can run into. Uh, for example, this pipe is closed here, and we have a pipe next to it with zero flow. Um, some, sometimes if you have pipes with zero flow, just due to the way that hammer has to convert the uh, calculated head loss to a friction factor, and it uses that during the transient simulation. Um, long story short, you can sometimes run into some uh, additional challenges and some further massaging of the data that's uh, required for you know, those, those situations. Uh, whereas if you're dealing with skeletonized version, um, that's not something that you have to you know, worry about. Um, also, there's some PRVs here. During a transient simulation, you have to kind of specify you know, are, are those able to actually dynamically modulate during the transient simulation? And if so, you know, how, how fast can they react? So you have to set up some coefficients, uh, things like that. So um, there's a couple other little things to watch out for. But, um, you know, the basic point is that, you know, the, the bigger the model, the more time it's going to take to prepare that for a transient simulation um, with possibly diminishing returns. Um, because, for example, in this case, you know, You've got a pump station. This is basically your 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 main line out here to the tank. You know what what we have in the skeletonized version, and that's really going to experience the worst transients as a result of a pump shutdown. And when you get way out into the model way over here, uh, the transient waves tend to dampen out, especially when things are, are looped around and just the friction tends to dampen things out. So usually, you know, it's not going to be a problem way out in the system. Uh, so by focusing on the skeletonized version, you can be pretty confident that you know if you can mitigates uh, harmful surges in the skeletonized version, then the rest of the model that you didn't include uh, should be okay.